Madam President, and seeing the distinguished presiding officer who is not only a New Englander, but in this case from Massachusetts, let me just speak personally for a moment on a very, very sad day. Tomorrow will be November 22nd. And ever since I was a law student, November 22nd has always brought a feeling of dread to me. Tomorrow will be 50 years since President Kennedy was murdered. <clears throat> My wife, Marcel, and I were living in Washington at that time. She was a young nurse, registered nurse, working at the VA hospital uh, on Wisconsin Avenue, a site now that occupied by the Russian embassy. She was helped, helping put this equally impoverished law student through Georgetown Law School. We had been there in this basement apartment first during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And like everybody, we held our breath in this city, wondering if this new young president, John F. Kennedy, could get us through this crisis without plunging the world into nuclear war. I was excited we both were to be in the same city. I, I, and my family always been Democrats back in Vermont, when the joke was, uh, that's the street where the Democrat lives on. There were so few of them in, in Vermont, but with an Irish Catholic father and Italian Catholic mother, and we had seen um, John Kennedy win, notwithstanding, even in my state, something that doesn't exist anymore, an anti-Catholic attitude. Also excited, but now the real test came in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And he stood up to those ex people, some in the Joint Chiefs, who said they had so much more experience and we ought to go ahead and we had nuclear superiority over the then Soviet Union. Let's, let's attack them. Let's have a preemptive strike. Madam President, anybody who studies history knows what would have happened. Half the world would have been destroyed. And still through patience and diplomacy, we get out of that situation. And so we watched a, a young president go step by step. Uh, not always accomplishing everything he wanted, but always inspiring young people. I remember standing on Pennsylvania Avenue and seeing an open car go by with him. He had greeted Emperor Haile Selassie. This was just months before he died. Driving down Pennsylvania Avenue, people cheering, and I was closer to him than I am to the distinguished presiding officer. We all were. I remember as a law student being invited to the White House with other students and standing there and being struck by how red his hair was, but how young he was, talking with all of us. But then, I remember, as though it was yesterday, and not 50 years ago tomorrow, when I was staying in the library at Georgetown University Law School, one of my classmates, who was not a fan of President Kennedy's, came in and said, the president's been shot. I told him this was not, there's nothing funny about saying something like that. And then I, I saw the shock look on his face and realized he was telling the truth. Now we didn't, we didn't have a car, I used to take the bus to, to school from where we lived in Glover Park area. I knew that Marcel had been working all night and probably home, gotten out of shift in the wee hours of the morning or early morning and was home sleeping. And I went running out and I grabbed a cab, 
said I'd go home and, and, and tell her what had happened. I think I got the only cab in Washington, D.C. to not have a radio. Cab driver didn't know what was going on. I just said, let's go. We drove by on, on K Street where a number of the um, stockbrokers were. And I remember different times going by there and seeing the, that time ticker tapes was uh, projected on the wall with the numbers going by the, the stock market. It was blank. Even though the stock market should have been open at that time, it was stopped. I saw Mrs. Kennedy's um, relative, Mr. Oshenslaus, who I used to see going to work at the brokerage being uh, chauffeured in a, in a um, Rolls Royce, and you can imagine as a young law student on this on air conditioned bus, I'd, I'd look with envy. I saw him running out frantically trying to grab a cab. It was very obvious something was wrong. And I got home, banged to the door, woke up Marcel. We turned on our TV set. I told her he'd been shot and she's coming awake. said, who? I said, the president. And we heard Walter Cronkite give, which something we used to keep saying over and over, have for 50 years. Now it's in the president, was shot and was dead. I know we prayed for him, his family, for our nation. Phones were just seizing up in Washington, but talked with our family back in Vermont. And we decided when the cortege was going to leave from the White House to bring the president's body up to Lyon State just a few yards from where we're now standing, we decided to go down and watch the funeral procession. We had thought about it. We were expecting our first child he was born in January, following this. But we thought, even so, we should go down, and we took the bus down, and we stood across to the National Art Gallery, what's now the West Wing of the National Art Gallery. Several lanes of road there, and, and hundreds of thousands of people along the street, and it was so quiet, Madam President, so quiet. As the street lights, even though the roads were blocked, the street lights were still going. And as they changed from red to green to yellow, we could hear the click. Five lanes across the road, we could hear the click of those street lights changing. It was that quiet. And then we heard the drums. And we heard the cortege leaving the White House. That was back before you had cell phones and everything else you could follow. Everybody on there turned down toward the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue, even though we could not yet see the cortege, but we could hear it. It was that silent. And then the cars came by the cortege, um, the riderless horse, a very almost skittish horse. It was, you could hear its, its horseshoes clicking back and forth as it, as it would pulled back and forth against the reins of the man leading it. The boots turned backward in the empty saddle. I saw Robert Kennedy go by in a car. In fact, I took a photograph of that. His head bowed, his chin on his hand. It was such a sad, sad thing. All and by, um, people saluted, held their hand over their heart, and cried. Again, a man of present is like it was yesterday. 
We watched the funeral from home. Mrs. Kennedy had decided that the, all these world leaders who had come here, that they would march from the White House to St. Matthews, where the president's funeral would be held. I remember there had been a discussion, well, what do you do for protocol? You got presidents and prime ministers and emperors. She made the brilliant de decision, take the countries alphabetically in English. But that meant that same Haley Selassie I'd seen in the open car with President Kennedy just a few months before. Man, very, very short man. Resplendent in a uniform with braids, everything else. Walking next to Charles de Gaulle, who, like myself, is well over six feet tall, in a very plain uniform without decorations. And nobody thought anything unusual about it. It was all so respectful. Because of so many heads of state, every police officer virtually in the city was downtown in that area. There wasn't a crime reported or committed in D.C. anywhere during that time. Everybody was glued to their TV sets. The funeral, Cardinal Cushing, Massachusetts, others there, young John Kennedy, John Jr. saluting the coffin as it went by. We were watching it when the burial at um, Arlington Cemetery, and we lived only a couple miles from there, and we saw the first jets in the sloop, the fighter jets flying over. We rushed outdoors just in time to see what we all know as the missing man uh, formation where the jets are in formation, but one peels off and goes straight up. We could see that from the street in front of our house. And then we saw Air Force One fly over and just coming out of having dipped its wing. This was a very large plane at that time. And here's Air Force One, blue and white and silver. Same plane that brought President Kennedy's body back a few days before from Dallas. And it was coming out of saluting. And Madam President, um, I say this because throughout that time and everywhere we went, you saw a silent and stunned city. Both those who had supported President Kennedy and those who had not. Everybody knew what a blow this was to our country. In fact, I, never, I did not see again that kind of shock and silence in Washington, D.C. until I walked from my office on 9-11 here in Capitol Hill and saw the same thing after the attack on us. You know, Madam President, Something like this, most people, you set aside political, your, your political background. I remember so many of us stood here on that March day when President Reagan was shot. We all joined hands, Democrats and Republicans, and prayed for his safety and for the country. It is awful that you have to have a situation like that to bring people together. But we should think about the country first and foremost in these things. We look at those in succession of the presidency. We worry about what might happen. The president, nobody ever wants anything to happen to any president, Republican or Democrat. But we don't want things to happen to our country. So I've, I was one of those young people inspired by Robert Kennedy, by, by, by John Kennedy, and, and by Robert Kennedy, who invited me to join the Department of Justice as a young law student, except I was homesick and wanted to go back to Vermont. 
I'm glad I did. But these were people that inspired young people. They inspired us because we saw political life and elective office is not as something for a cynical gain or something to promote yourself or something where you could do bumper sticker sloganeering. I don't care the left or the right, but rather as something to have to make life better for everybody else and to make your country better and stronger and to leave a better country for the next generation. I think that was the promise of John Kennedy. I am glad that many in both parties decided to follow that same promise. I just wish more would. Madam President, I thank my colleagues for letting me have all this time. I yield the floor.